Speaking of later, look at the time. This lecture is getting long already, and we've yet to discuss sinusoidal control. Let's do this quick and send you on your way. As I mentioned earlier, there exist construction variations for permanent magnet motors, and some, not all, motors with embedded permanent magnets on the rotor and sinusoidally wound stators are known as permanent magnet synchronous motors and can benefit from a style of sinusoidal control known as field-oriented control, abbreviated FOC, using space vector modulation, sometimes abbreviated SVM. So what the FOC is FOC? And how are we gonna talk about FOC without talking about the math? Notably, the forward and reverse Clark and Park transforms, alpha and beta currents, and delta quadrature transforms. Here's how we're gonna talk about it, quickly with a lots of simplifications. So you remember about five or 10 minutes ago when I said the optimal angle for torque is when the stator leads the rotor by 90 degrees. And I baited and switched you and said, well, actually we energize the stator 120 degrees ahead. And the rotor moves through 90, and when it reaches a relative angle of 60, we reset it at 120 and repeat. This would be akin to waving a carrot in front of a donkey inside the optimal range. Well, why not do exactly as I initially suggested and put the stator exactly 90 degrees ahead and keep it there? This would be akin to putting the carrot in front of the donkey exactly where he wants it. But for every step forward the donkey takes, no matter if the donkey is walking, trotting, loping, racking, cantering, or galloping, the carrot moves forward an equal amount, i.e. torque is always at an optimum value. This method necessitates a little bit more precise knowledge of the rotor's present position than three chintzy hall effect sensors on the stator might allow and requires an investment in additional hardware and processing power and money for the controller. One method of determining rotor position with more precision uses an incremental rotary encoder called AB encoding. An AB encoder uses two sensors, A and B, slightly offset from one another such that when the sensors receive A then B, it means the shaft is going counterclockwise. If however the sensors receive B then A, it must mean that the shaft is going clockwise. Beyond detecting rotational direction, signals A and B have a preset number of pulses per revolution, or PPR, where an increasing number of pulses per revolution means enhanced resolution. For example, consider an AB encoder using 360 pulses per revolution. 360 degrees, 360 pulses, every single pulse means the rotor moves one degree. If, however, an AB encoder uses 720 pulses per revolution, every single pulse means the rotor has moved 0.5 degrees, thus yielding more precise and accurate information about the rotor's present position. AB encoders also include a third signal, Z. You'd think it'd be C, but it isn't, it's Z. The Z or index signal happens once per revolution and serves as a way of determining an absolute position from the last full rotation. For example, if the AB sensors are used in 360 pulses per revolution, and they've experienced 135 pulses since the last Z pulse, the rotor must be at 135 degrees. If you want the stator 90 degrees ahead of this for optimal torque, it needs to be at 135 plus 90 or 225. With this more precise positional data as input to our controller, as well as current sensors in the stator and ideal field orientation, hence the name, can be generated by the inverter controller such that it remains precisely 90 degrees ahead of the rotor rather than moving back and forth inside a range that includes 90. To illustrate how this works, let's return to our simplified inverter schematic. Beyond three phase, six step, 120 degree pulse width modulation with positional feedback we previously discussed, there exist other switching mechanisms that yield different outputs. Consider 180 degree modulation where not two switches, but three inside our inverter are closed at any given time. I found it sometimes easier to introduce 180 degree modulation using numerical data rather than abstract quantities as in our previous examples. Consider a 24 volt DC source and a permanent magnet synchronous motor where the three Y configured windings are modeled as identical eight ohm impedances. Consider the applied voltages across windings U, V, and W when top positive switch Q1 is closed and bottom negative switches Q5 and Q6 are closed. This essentially places V and W in parallel with one another. Given their identical eight ohm impedances, this parallel pair presents four ohms of impedance. This is in series with winding U's eight ohm impedance for total impedance of 12 ohms. With 24 volts, two amps of current flows into U and half of this or one amp flows out of V and the remaining one amp flows out of W, such that winding U experiences positive 16 volts, and V and W, given current is leaving them, 
both experience negative 8 volts. This particular switching state is known as PNN, meaning the positive switch in the first column is closed and the negative switches in columns 2 and 3 are closed. Given our stator arrangement, winding U and the contributions of windings V and W coalesce into one unified field pointing straight up and down at 0 degrees. The next state is PPN, meaning the top positive switches Q1 and Q2 close and the bottom negative switch Q6 closes. This places windings U and V in parallel with one another and series with W for a total impedance of 12 ohms. The 24 volt DC source forces one amp each into U and V and the summation of two amps leaves W. Both U and V experience positive 8 volt drops and W, given current is leaving it, experiences the remaining negative 16 volts. The magnetic fields of U, V, and W coalesce into one unified field pointing at roughly 60 degrees. I'll save you the trouble of reading off the four remaining switch states, NPN, NPP, NNP, and PNP, and get straight to the point. The outputs of U, V, and W using 180 degree modulation have a much more sign-like quality to them than our previously discussed 120 degree modulation. You're welcome to pause the lecture and verify this yourself, but a pattern emerges for the windings given the six different active switch combinations. Positive one-third applied voltage, positive two-thirds applied voltage, positive one-third applied voltage, negative one-third applied voltage, negative two-thirds applied voltage, negative one-third applied voltage, and each winding experiences a relative 120 degree phase shift from each other. Each of these switch states results in a particular spatial orientation of the magnetic field inside the stator that looks something like this. PNN points at zero degrees, PPN points at 60 degrees, NPN points at 120 degrees, NPP points at 180 degrees, NNP points at 240 degrees, and finally PNP points at 300 degrees. Pretty cool, huh? But wait, there's more. Now here's where the modulation and space vector modulation happens. What if we wanted a magnetic field at 30 degrees, halfway between 0 and 60? Well, why not use a pulse width modulation signal that applies PPN for 50% of the time and PNN for the remaining 50%? You're essentially equally flip-flopping back and forth or modulating between the two nearest spatial vectors, hence the name. If this is gin, this is juice, this is gin and juice. What if you want something closer to 60? Well, you could apply PPN for 75% of the time and PNN for the remaining 25%. More gin, less juice. Similarly, what if you wanted something even closer to 60? Well, you could apply PPN for 90% of the time and PNN for the remaining 10%. Even more gin and still less juice. Ultimately, by toggling back and forth between the two nearest spatial vectors at a duty cycle proportional to their influence, one can create a continuously variant rotating magnetic field that approximates an analog sinusoidal quantity with an astonishing degree of fidelity, especially when done so at high rates of switching frequency. I say again, we can create a continuously variant rotating magnetic field. Importantly, using positional feedback from the more precise incremental encoder, this rotating magnetic field is always perfectly 90 degrees ahead in motor mode, or negative 90 degrees behind in generator mode, thus ensuring torque remains optimal. Even more features of field-oriented control and space vector modulation await your discovery. In addition to orientation, we can also modulate the modulations, if you will, to produce differing magnitude field strengths at different spatial locations. What if you wanted a reduced field midway between NPN and NPP. You could apply NPP for 33% of the time, NPN for 33% of the time, and nothing for 33% of the time. This nothing or null state, depending upon implementation, might be known as PPP, where all the positive switches close, or NNN, where all the bottom switches are closed. By increasing the ratio of the null state in proportion to the two nearest vectors, we can decrease state or field strength. Conversely, by decreasing the ratio of the null state in proportion to the two nearest spatial vectors, we can increase state of field strength. This is field-oriented control using space vector modulation, and this is truly as far as we're going to get today. Like I said, there's a lot of math involved in the precise control of speed, torque, and or position of brushless DC and permanent magnet synchronous motors. In addition to all the details about power electronics devices central to the inverter that we skipped over, 
not to mention generator mode, regenerative braking, and field weakening, which enables a permanent magnet motor to operate at elevated speeds. This being said, I think we did a pretty good job at explaining at least the basics on an introductory level and didn't get lost in the Blackberries. We'll examine these and other topics and applications and hardware and math in greater detail in later lectures. Until then, that's all I got for you today. In conclusion, this lecture discussed the construction and theory of operation of brushless DC and permanent magnet synchronous motors. Additionally, we looked at the power electronics devices essential to their operation and those accessory devices like shaft encoders and incremental rotary encoders that can form feedback loops to ensure the rotor remains synchronized with the stator despite changes in torque and control patterns such that torque remains optimal. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.